Hi everyone, it's Jerry. I have an interesting game to share with you. On the white end, Leela Night Odds, no King Knight for this game. Playing against Grandmaster Joel Benjamin. In a classical time control. 60 minutes with a 30 second increment. Now this was game 3 from an ongoing 8 game match. The first two games, I should note, were very clean wins by Benjamin. Uh, not the same story in this one. Now, I'm going to put a lot of focus on the end game phase. Uh, some instruction for you in an opposite color bishop ending. Let's see where things go south here somewhat for Benjamin. Now, a couple notes here about Joel. Uh, he is uh, his peak FIDE rating, 2600 plus. And if you were around in 1997, uh, you may recall uh, he was the official Grandmaster Consultant uh, hired by IBM for the Deep Blue versus Kasparov match. So certainly a very interesting opponent here for Leela. Now I believe right around here is maybe a step in the wrong direction for Black. Uh, E5 is a little bit more vulnerable because of this last move. And this is a window of opportunity for Leela. Presses here with d4, trying to establish an alpha zero pawn. Black, not so quick to give up at this point. We get the capture, recapture, and now pawn play. Queen h5, what do you do now? Queen's intention. Do you duck? the queen exchange and allow peace capture some simplification on e4 that in general should be good news for the side up the piece having a an open position peace exchange is more likely interesting follow-up leela actually exchanges queens now what's the big idea well the follow-up here leela establishes two pawns in black's house has an alpha zero pawn controls f6 and so what this means right around the corner there is g4 trapping that knight what do you do now is black at this stage black has to try and come up with a clean way to give up some material with g4 right around the corner and i believe the approach taken here by benjamin is one of the cleanest he goes with g6 and he's eventually going to sacrifice a knight for two pawns and be up two pawns. Uh, if you play in it a different way, for instance, bishop g5, maybe it's a bit too complicated. Not as clean playing in this way. After g4, rook takes pawn, pawn takes knight, maybe knight f3 at some point. Uh, also, if knight f4 here, knight f3 and black would no longer even be winning uh the approach taken here by black is with g6 knight gets kicked fiend keto knight and now we have e6 <laughs> uh, the approach here is to sacrifice the knight on e6 at this stage if you play in a different way let's say you capture with a pawn uh, that would be welcoming uh an imbalance this pawn will soon track down the dark square bishop we have a knight uh, versus dark square bishop imbalance to think about. Also, if the bishop moves here, there's f7 with a fork. So this is really the cleanest approach at this stage. Give that piece back and now play a position where you're up two pawns. And there's a threat here on g4. All right, that's defended. This knight still out of bounds. Black tries to influence g4. It goes nowhere. It's supported. So we get this A pawn advance. Loves playing with the rook pawns. And we're going to get some simplification in here shortly. Bishop getting out of the way of the knight. Has its eye on uh, this f4 square. He's really going to key in on f4 shortly. We do get a rook exchange in there. Knight reposition. Bishop pointing now. At a7, we do repeat a little bit. Now, I haven't touched on the clock times for Leela. Uh, Leela's been 
moving once every few seconds. <laughs> That's how it's set up to play at that, that speed. Uh, play very quickly. Joel, only down to, what, 16 minutes and change from here? He ends up going for the B pun at this stage. Still a decisive advantage for Black. Uh, computer has its eye on this idea. Rook E8. And if now Bishop takes pawn, it wants to go down here to the first rank and meet either king move with knight d3. Knight takes b2 and doing something along this uh, first rank, trying to take advantage of the, uh, the bishop here on d1. If this guy is picked up, this collapses, these pawns start to run. All right, if the bishop backs off, or if it captures the knight, that's going to be good news as well for black, the bishop pair. You back off here, there's knight e2 check. And that cuts off the bishop's support of g4. Rook e8, not played in this one. He goes after the b pawn. We exchange a pawn and b pawn. And bishop back in business here, nice and central. King improvement. Now we get the bishop for knight exchange. This pawn, no longer defended, but if you pick it up, you're going to drop the b pawn. So it's first the bishop for knight exchange. And now the rook goes hunting for the g pawn. This bishop sticks around, at least for the moment, watching over the b pawn in case there's any pressure there. And not really a whole lot of time here remaining for Benjamin. He meets rook d8 with rook e8. And this is now going to be a draw. Uh, it turns out these two pawns will not be good enough to push through for a win. Now, Leela goes ahead, exchanges rooks here. What would have been a winning approach? I'll put on a few moves. Uh, it's looking at bishop g4, bishop h6, and then some check, rook h8. Still, I imagine some work to be done here. It's... Uh, complicated. The bishop is in a pin. If you want to get out of the pin, you have to go here with then this. But if you play that, this pawn falls and there's potential passer on the queen side. All right, not an approach we take. In short, uh, black needs to keep the rooks on board. So meeting rook d8 with rook e8, it's not going to be a winning way. So we end up getting the rook exchange. Let's see how Leela holds this draw. It's actually not a very uh, difficult one. And I say this because uh, black ends up never establishing any of these kingside pawns on dark squares. And there's going to be a dark square blockade. And this bishop is always in an uh, easy spot to successfully defend the queenside pawns. There's no way for this king to simultaneously apply pressure to both of these pawns. Um, you'd have to play in an illegal way to do that, <laughs> be positioned on B4. So what's going to happen from here, the king slips in like so, pokes around on A4, puts pressure here, pressure there, but the bishop is always in a spot to defend these two points in an easy way, and the king ends up blockading these pawns. This is the position I'm going to return to right here. We're going to look at king f6 from this position. This is how the game plays out from here. Just seeing it mapped out, we have the king here as the blockader. King, pressure on the a pawn, the c pawn, they're always defended. He tries coming over here on the king side, but there's no progress to be made because of this dark square blockade. Players, well, it's a draw at this point. 66 moves in. Now, what would have been the way to draw if a different approach was taken here by Benjamin? For instance, in this position here, rather than e6 with the king. If he goes to f6, the king steps up here, holding up the g5 push. And in this position here, let's say the pawns start to roll on dark squares. I want to point out a couple things here. There's an idea for white on the queen side. And if that's, if that idea is prevented, I want to show you how you can hold this as a draw here. So first of all, 
black in general, if you're going to be advancing these pawns, one of the two should almost always be on a dark square. That way you do not allow uh, white to form a dark square blockade. So if you're playing this move right here, there you go, a dark square blockade with the bishop, the king. Let's say black in this position here gets going with the pawns, sticking around on dark squares, coordinating with the bishop. Check this move out. Bishop c5. You see what just happened? The c pawn is now blockaded. What does this mean? Well, the king could now hunt the b pawn and there's no defending it. And it would be black, in fact, who would have to at some point pitch the g pawn to remove the blockader of the c pawn so that it could move and get out of the way of the bishop so that it can control that promotion square. This will end up being a draw. The bishop sacrifices itself for the pawn. A drawn position. Uh, if ever this pawn here on c3 is defended with the bishop, it will be uh, deflected eventually with the h pawn. It's a drawn ending here. Now let's say black chooses a different move. So in other words, rather than play g5 at this moment and allow bishop c5, let's say c5 is played. Ah. Now this would no longer be an idea. The bishop would be there to defend. How to draw this position then if black starts uh, playing with these connected passers? In general, black should be looking to advance these pawns so that one of them is always on a dark square. If they're ever on, if they're ever both on light squares, you run the risk of being, uh, they run the risk of being blockaded. King getting to g5 for instance, like it played out in the game. Uh, let's say they continue marching like so. Now, there is a dream setup for black, and that setup is one where both of these pawns are coordinated with the bishop in white's house. So I'm talking specifically about this arrangement here, h-pawn on h4, g pawn on g3 in one other detail the king positioned right here on g4 if that setup is allowed black will be winning white has to try and interfere with that let's see how what would be the method the method is to apply pressure to these pawns from behind with the bishop so this is a good start Pressure on something. We can't get to f8 just yet. Say the king moves. Okay, we put pressure on that base point. Now if the king tries to play the leader role, it can't go any further after it's on h5. You move forward from there, you drop the h-pawn. So that's not going to be progress. So let's say the pawn advances. Bishop pointless anymore on this diagonal. So pressure on something. And where do you go from here? That's not leading anywhere. Pawns on light. There'll be a dark square blockade. Let's try h4. Now, from this point, the bishop is perfect here. The king, no longer necessary here in the center, does not need to play some role of shielding the king or anything. And in fact, it could be in the way, in some cases, of the bishop. It may need to get to this diagonal at some point, stopping this h-pawn the king can actually go all the way over here to this f2 square. And that is a perfect setup. So let me get those moves in here and just clear the way. I get this bishop out of the h-pawn's way. In this scenario, if the pawn is back here, if the king is here, here, it's still all a draw here for white. Bishop is perfect. Let's say the king improves. And we make a waiting move at this stage. I'll say this is the correct square, just because it has more options, but there's another detail that I'll be highlighting shortly. Uh, from d8, it only has five options. From here, it's seven. Let's go with bishop f6. This is a drawing way. Now, this is where white will have to be precise. After g4... Right around the corner, there is g3, king g4, and black has that set up. This is where white must now be timely. King e3, and 
F4 just in the nick of time, keeping pressure on both pawns from behind. And a detail in this case here, the king does play that role of shielding the king from getting to uh, G4 here. This will now be a draw. Push the H pawn, G pawn falls. Push the G pawn, the bishop is there to blockade on the dark squares. There's no progress here for black. What do you do? You move the king, you're going to drop the H pawn. You move the bishop, we can target the G pawn. Are we going to dance here on these two? Or are you going to push this pawn and allow the dark square blockade? There's no progress once that is in effect. So once this position in short has been established, there's no uh, way to make uh, progress here for Team Black. This is a successful defense in this opposite color bishop ending. Now one final note here. A really cool move I stumbled upon in playing through this ending. It does matter <laughs> where you go with this bishop in this case. Now I said let's go here because it has more options than this d8 square. Well, if you go to d8, you would actually be losing. Let's see why. <laughs> There's a really flashy move here. Let's go with g4. And g3, the king is there. Pressure here, pressure there. But guess what? Black has a winning move here. Feel free to pause the video and see if you can spot it. Okay, the winning move with the bishop on d8 rather than f6 is b5. Now, I could take the pawn on Passan, right? Well, hang on. If you do that, you're not going to be in a spot to prevent queening. <laughs> we could have a pawn race, but black is going to win out in the end with a skewer. Now, if white doesn't reply to b5 with the capture, let's say it goes, uh, the bishop goes to b6 here. Well, now there is a third pass pawn, and this will be winning. For black. So just a, a funny little note there I, I stumbled upon. It does, because of these pawns having some movement and a flashy b5 move involved, it does matter where you post up the bishop. This is the main idea though. Put the bishop working from behind here, put pressure on the pawns, and this king on f2 is going to hold this one pretty easily. Anyhow, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, the try there, uh, how it played out in this game, he ended up move, maneuvering about on the light squares. These pawns were just blockaded on the king side and just no progress here. But interesting result, I, I think, here in this classical time control. What are your thoughts on this one? Feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.